All right, hello everybody. This is our March 2019 patron hangout, and we are talking about the topic of uh, Jesus and altruism. Uh, more specifically, was Jesus an altruist? And the reason that we're talking about this, the reason that you should think about this as relevant, is because it's really at the core of the difficulty that Christians are having uh, when it comes to combating the, the current cultural climate of social justice and intersectionality and progressivism and all, all the all the ugly surprising things that we're seeing in the culture today uh i would argue they're actually not that surprising uh and it's actually not that surprising that it's seeping into the church and that the church is being influenced by it so easily and, and that's because uh it all i think is rooted in this idea that jesus was an altruist uh, and, and we'll get into what we mean by that but if you if you look at everything that's going on in our culture today and everything that we're concerned about, what uh, Dave Rubin calls the oppression Olympics, where it's, it's a race to uh, be classified as more oppressed than other people. And this is at the heart of intersectionality too, right? So it's not just that I'm oppressed as a female, let's say, but I'm oppressed as a black female, or you're really, really oppressed if, if you're a, a black female transgender person. Right. And so it's, it's this race to try to be viewed as oppressed as possible, to try to be viewed as much as a victim as possible. And, and victimhood, victimology is, is lifted up as the ultimate standard, the, the ultimate goal that people are seeking after. And, and, and why is that? It's because we all have this idea that morality, the essence of morality, the, the essence of value and virtue in our lives, it's all about siphoning from those who do not suffer to those who do suffer. If, if you're suffering, if you're in need, then you've, you've got a just claim against those who aren't suffering and who aren't in need. And if you aren't suffering and you're not in need, then you're privileged. And, and that's just luck. And, and, and you ought to give up your privilege. You ought to give up your self-interest for the sake of those who suffer, for the, the sake of those who are victims. And, and that's the essence of morality. That, that's, that's what most people consider moral today, including many Christians. And a lot of that, like I said, is rooted in the idea that Jesus was the ultimate altruist. You look at Jesus dying for the sins of other people on the cross. He, he paid the ultimate sacrifice, some of our worship songs say. Um, he, he denied himself and took up his cross for the sake of other people, for the sake of those in need, for the sake of the, the needy, the, the hurting, the suffering, the victims. And, and, that's, and, and that's the extent of our moral theology. It's this idea of self-sacrifice as an end in itself. And so if we want to combat the intersectionality and the oppression Olympics and the social justice and all of this nonsense in the culture, we're not going to be able to do it unless we challenge this idea that Jesus was an altruist, that Jesus was about sacrifice as an end in itself. Let's talk for a moment about what it means to think in principle about a moral code as such. Nobody here is denying that it's a good thing to care about other people. Jesus obviously did, and Jesus obviously cares for his people, and he paid a price in order to redeem them. Nobody's denying that that was something that happened in the process, but what was the ultimate goal? So when you think in principle, you have to ask, what was the final goal? What was the standard by which he measured the value? And there is an ethos that says that it would have been wrong for Jesus not to save us. And because we had a need that constitutes a claim on him, and because he's a moral God, therefore, the only right thing for him to do was for him to sacrifice himself and give himself up for us. But when we're looking at what the scripture says, and we're looking at it in principle, we can analyze Jesus's motive. Was it altruistic or was it something else? So let's talk about this term altruism for a moment. It's the belief in or practice of disinterested and selfless concern for the well-being of others. That's just a standard like Google definition. And the term was coined by Auguste Comte, and uh, it was like from the 1800s, a French theologian slash philosopher. And he tried to create this new moral system that people could live by. And it was otherism. Altruism means the otherism. It means self-sacrifice for its own sake. And that is treated as the standard of value. The trouble with treating other people's value as the standard of value is that you haven't answered the question, what is the standard? Um, it, so he got away from the Aristotelian approach that says that, um, that you die, me, you, what is it, Jacob? Eudaimonia. 
eudaimonia, eudaimonia yeah. um, flourishing, human flourishing is the standard. And uh, so if you don't have such a standard, you get somewhat lost and it just turns into a game of seeking out who is the biggest victim. And, and that's why intersectionality has come to dominate the discourse today. So in scripture, do we see that uh, Jesus was willing to do hard things and suffer purely for the final goal of pleasing us and helping us? Or was it purely and finally for some other goal? To answer that question, we need to look at Philippians 2 verses 1 through 11. It's a significant passage. I'm going to be reading it right now. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. This is a passage that you've probably heard preached many times. Verse four, let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among you, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So far, this sounds very much like altruism, but then we keep reading. Verse 9, therefore God, was highly, therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So it was to the glory of God the Father, and it was exalting Jesus Christ. And I'm going to go on to the other main passage that we always want to refer to that talks about Jesus's motivation, and that would be Hebrews 12 too. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross and despise, despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. These, both of these passages talk about Jesus doing something that was difficult and that was in some sense a sacrifice. It was, he was giving up something and suffering, but it was not sacrifice for the sake of sacrifice. It was sacrifice for the sake of gain. That is the key to understanding Jesus's motive. And um, now our question for this whole video is, is Jesus an altruist? We can look at that from a couple different angles. One is, what, is, what did Jesus do? What was his motive? And the other is, what did Jesus teach? So we're going to be pulling up a whole bunch of verses. And if you right now are on a computer, you can go to christianintellectual.com. And you can go to uh, christianintellectual.com slash egoism, and you'll find a study guide that gives you verses that talk about Jesus' teaching that bear on the issue of, is he teaching egoism? Is he teaching altruism? Egoism would be, roughly speaking, or generally, it would be the opposite of altruism. It would mean seeking value for yourself. And we believe, and that's what Jacob and I are arguing here, that Jesus ultimately is motivated by his own rational self-interest. Yeah, Michael, well, would you me, like to jump in before we move on? Yeah, let me just comment on those two passages real quickly. It, mm -hmm. It's really important, and, and the meaning of altruism versus egoism. Uh, by, by egoism, really, the best way to think about it is uh, having an ultimate positive value orientation. So you're, in, the, in the final analysis, your ultimate orientation, your ultimate motivation is toward positive values, whereas in altruism, your ultimate uh, motivation is in the negation of value for yourself. Um, and, and that's really the difference. And, and if Jesus was an altruist, if Jesus was seeking uh, self-denial as an end in itself or sacrifice as an end in itself, then Hebrews 12 too wouldn't say that he despised the shame for the joy set before him. It would say that he despised the joy set before him for the glory of the shame. He, he, it would turn Jesus and, in some ways, God the Father into a divine masochist, a divine sadomasochist, because he calls us to follow suit. Um, and, and that's really what we're talking about here. If, if altruism is the correct morality, then uh, the, the correct morality is, is very masochistic. It's, it's sacrifice as an end in itself. It's self-denial as an end in itself with no positive value on the other side. And if there is a positive value on the other side, then we're talking about rational self-interest. We're talking about loosely what we, what we call egoism. 
Uh, and, and that's what we see in all of these passages that we're going to look at, but especially those two that we just looked at, where we look at Jesus's motivation. It's for the joy set before him that he endured the cross. Yes, he endured the cross. And yes, that was a sacrifice in a sense. Uh, but don't take that out of context. Don't rob him of his passion, of his joy, which is what he's, what he's going to get on the other side of the cross, which is glory and, and an eternity with his people, right? And, and uh, if you look at Philippians 2, a, a favorite passage for those who want to peddle uh, self-sacrifice as in it itself, no one, wh wh when they're quoting the beginning part of Philippians 2, no one usually finishes that passage by saying, therefore, God has highly exalted him. Therefore, to the end that, Jesus lowered himself to the end that, for the sake of being highly exalted, for the sake of redeeming a people, so that they would glorify him. And, and you see that in John 17, when he's praying before he goes to the cross, Father, glorify me with the glory that I had with you before the world began. And I pray that these that I'm purchasing with my blood now would be with me where I am. Why? So that they may see my glory, John 17, 24. It's all about a positive value orientation. It's all about glory. It's all about life and joy and pleasure. It's not about self-denial as an end in itself. It's not about death and suffering and disease and need as an end in itself, which is what the mindset of altruism would have us believe. And that's why we've got the, the oppression Olympics, so to speak, that we've got today in the culture. So we believe that if you look through, especially the gospels, if you look through what Jesus is teaching, let's look at Matthew. You're going to find many things that would just put an end to this idea that self-sacrifice is the motivation that Jesus is teaching us to have. So we could start in Matthew 5, 29. If your right hand offends you, pluck it out, cast it from you. It's profitable for you that if that one of your members should perish rather than your whole body be cast into hell. So Jesus here is speaking in terms of what is profitable. Matthew 6 Take heed not to do your alms before men to be seen by them. Otherwise, you have no reward of your father, in which, which is in heaven. So he's giving us the, the reasoning. Otherwise, you have no reward. Something that we want to point out again and again is that this idea of egoism, it's not just any old kind of egoism. There's subspecies of it, like Nietzschean egoism. We're talking about rational egoism. We're talking about Jesus doing something in view of a future reward. That makes it rational. And who is the recipient of the reward? Well, it's the person who's doing the action. So uh, in Matthew, you could just go on and on. It's almost impossible to find a chapter in Matthew that doesn't in some way touch on the topic of motivations. But, you know, he talks about don't do your alms in public and don't sound the trumpet because then you'll lose your reward that your father would give you. And he says, you know, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. And uh, you go on to Matthew 10. Don't fear those who would kill the body, but uh, they're not able to kill the soul. Fear the one that's going to destroy both soul and body in hell. So what is your motivation? Well, protecting yourself. Self-preservation is a legitimate Christian teaching. And, and, and notice it's, it's rational self-preservation. It's not protect every hair on your head. It's not even protect your body necessarily. It's protect your soul. If, if, if you have to choose between your soul and your body, protect your soul because your body will be raised from the dead. Your soul will not be. Uh, and, and so that, that, that's, you have to engage your reason in order to judge. You have to have a hierarchy of values and a hierarchy of what's most important, what, what is expendable uh, for the sake of what is most important. And, and that's what makes it rational. Uh, if, if you were to give up your soul for the sake of your body, that would be irrational because you can't, you, your, your body's useless without your soul. But on the other hand, if you are to give up your body for the sake of your soul, well, your soul is eternal and your body can be res raised from the dead. And so it's perfectly rational to give up your body for the sake of your soul if you need to. C.S. Lewis rejected the Kantian ethic and in his book, Mere Christianity and other places, he talks about this. And uh, so he talks about the unblushing appeals to reward. And he points it out as sort of a surprise uh, to the ethos that we have in churches today. But you know, he says things like, uh, you know, everyone that has forsaken their houses, brethren, sisters, father, mother, wife, children, or lands for my sake shall receive a hundredfold and shall inherit eternal life. And th these kinds of things where you might not expect that Jesus would be so directly appealing to what you would consider the, the quest for gain, the desire for reward. Uh, so 
so there, I mean, that's, I'm just scrolling through Matthew and finding the, the passages that I've highlighted. Uh, you know, Matthew 25, his Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. I'll make you ruler of many things. Enter into the joy of thy Lord. This is the motivation that Jesus characteristically portrays in his teaching. So now the, the next thing, and we're going to get to more questions in a little while, but the next thing is we wanted to contrast some of the passages in the New Testament that would often be used to argue against this egoist conception of who Jesus is that we're talking about. Uh, Jacob, you have the notes there. Did you want to start on that or you want me to? Uh, you go ahead because I'm not sure which one you wanted to go to next. Okay, so let's look at, uh, I, it's basically in, in the order that you have in your Bible, starting in Romans 14, here's a passage that Paul has. Romans 14, 7, for none of us lives to himself and no man dies to himself. For whether we live. So hold on, let, let's stop. Uh, no one lives to himself and no one dies to himself. Therefore, we ought to live for other people and die for other people, right? That, that, that's what Paul's saying. Because nope. you're not supposed to live for yourself or die to yourself, you're supposed to live for other people, right? What, what, is it, isn't that what he says? What does he um, want to say, Cody? He says, for whether we live, we live unto the Lord, and whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ both died and rose and revived that he might be Lord, both of the dead and the living. Oh, you, you mean that the Lord isn't other people? Other people aren't the Lord? That, that's strange. I think too often we, we, we make that equivocation in our thinking. We, we think if the Bible talks about denial of self, it must be for the sake of other people. And really, it's sort of atheistic to think that way because you're, you're cutting God out of the picture. Because usually when the Bible's talking about the denial of self, it's saying for the sake of the Lord. And, and if you really think about it, it, it's for the sake of your relationship with the Lord. You're, you're living unto Christ and you're dying unto Christ. You are maintaining your relationship with Christ in either scenario. It's, it's all about your relationship to God. It's, it's not about your relationship with other people. That's, that's secondary. That's tertiary even. Uh, but too often we, we read these passages about self-interest or the denial of self-interest and we jump immediately to, therefore, we should serve other people. Therefore, it's all about other people. And, and I want to say, no, let, let's focus on our relationship with God. That's what Paul's calling us to here. And, and if that involves serving other people in certain contexts, amen, let's do it. But it's for the sake of our relationship with God. It's between me and God, ultimately. Other people just come into the picture incidentally. It reminds me of when David sinned against a man, and then he said to God, it's against you and you only that I've sinned. David had the right understanding of what's really going on, what really matters. So when we do see a call to help other people, to bear with them, say Romans 15, verse 1, we then are strong, we have to bear with the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let everyone please his neighbor for his good edification. It's always in the context of so that you can be like your Lord. Verse 3, for even Christ please not himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproached thee fell on me. It's a description of how you can be like God. And it's the same thing about, you know, God sends his reign on both the just and, and the unjust. And uh, it's, what does it say about you if, you if you only love the people that love you? There's something godly about being willing to show love to people that don't yet deserve it. But moving on to 1 Corinthians 1, no flesh, this is verse 29, no flesh should glory in his presence, but of him uh, are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. So it's not saying we should not glory. It is saying that the highest value, the highest thing worth glorying in is the Lord. Uh, there's another objection somebody might raise is, well, how can you talk about self-interest when so much of what Paul says is, is about our horizontal relationship among each other and how we ought to, we ought to be willing to lose in our relationship with each other if it glorifies God. So for example, uh, skip on over to first Corinthians six, seven. Now, therefore there is utterly fault among you because you go to law with one another. Why do you not rather take wrong? Why do you not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? But what's his reasoning? What's it, yeah, rather than what? What, what? What's the consequence that Paul is trying to avoid in uh, not going to law against each other? Oh, thank you. It's going to go against what uh, Jesus said in 
uh, in, was it Matthew? No, in, uh, in John 17, where, where he's talking about how the people are going to know that you're my followers if you love one another. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's being a light unto the world by, by showing the unity that we have. And this goes back a little bit to Philippians 2, the beginning of Philippians 2. Uh, the, the thing that motivates us to uh, be loving and in, in a certain context, self-sacrificial towards one another, especially within the body, is the fact that we have this unifying value, this supreme, ultimate unifying value of being in the Lord together. We are one body. And, and this is echoes of Ephesians 5, talking about marriage and how uh, you are one body with your spouse and no man has ever hated his own body. Uh, it, you've got to assume this uh, morality of rational self-interest in order for that to even make sense. Because if, if we didn't have that, then you would say, yeah, men are supposed to hate their own body, therefore they should hate their wife, and therefore they should hate uh, uh, fellow Christians and believers because they are one body with each other, and uh, we should not serve our own bodies. We should not serve ourselves. And by serving uh, other people in the body, I'm uh, serving myself because we're all one body, and therefore I should just try to uh, self-sacrifice all of us altogether. That, that would be the masochistic, altruistic way of approaching this issue, but that's not how Paul approaches it. He says, we're all one body. You, you guys have an ultimate value that you share together. And, and you need to remember that and, and focus on that rather than focusing on those things that are less valuable, like little disagreements between you. So Jacob, should we seek gain? Should we seek profit? This is an issue that it is actually a little bit confusing when you're reading Paul sometimes. Now, there are plenty of things in Paul where he says that the work is worthy of his hire and he doesn't want himself to be disqualified. And we'll get to those. But on the face of it, there are some things where Paul seems to say, don't be seeking your own profit. But you have to read the whole Bible in context. So Jesus has already said, what does it profit you if you gain the whole world, lose your soul? Jesus speaks in terms of profit and reward. So in light of that, we come to, and everybody knew that, in light of that, we come to chapter 10 in 1 Corinthians, let no man seek his own, but every man another's wealth. Whatever is sold in the shambles, that eat asking no questions for conscience sake. And then uh, skipping ahead to 31, it says, whether therefore you eat or drink, whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God, give none offense, neither to the Jews nor the Gentiles, uh, nor to the church of God, even as I please all men in all things, not seeking mine own profit, but the profit of many that they may be saved. So he gave a that, that they may be saved. Yeah, th there's a uh, reason for it. All of this short-term sacrifice and not seeking your own profit is in light of the mission. And the mission is glorious. And, and the mission actually uh, is the glory being revealed in us. And that's something yeah. that we should want. And since we're talking about Paul uh, and 1 Corinthians even, go to 1 Corinthians 13, the, the famous love chapter. Uh, and it starts off with love seeks not its own, but it ends with uh, even if I give all I have to the poor and surrender my body to the flames. In other words, in a, even if I do these supposedly uh, ultimate loving things, but have not love, it profits me nothing. There are two things there that Paul's assuming. One is that love isn't in actions. You, you can do so-called loving actions and not be motivated by love. And second, it's that love is ultimately self-interested. He's saying, uh, if you don't do it out of love, it's not going to profit you anything. Implication, you, you should be seeking profit in order to be loving. You, you should be seeking what's actually long-term good for you and therefore for other people in order to be genuinely loving. That, that's what true love is. So how about this one, Jacob? This is in Ephesians 4. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor working with his hands the thing which is good that he may have to give to him that needeth. Is this, isn't this is this a need-oriented ethos? Uh, I, I think there, <clears throat> there's a, uh, let's see, how, how should I say, uh, a per, I, I can't think of the word. Um, that, that there's, a, there's a secondary uh, so that there. He says so that he, he can give to those who need, right? So that he can have something to give rather than taking. Um, so uh, it, in a sense, that there's, a, there's a, a goal of being others-oriented or being need-oriented. But you have to step back and ask the question, is Paul assuming a context of a greater need? Uh, 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 I'm sorry, of a greater goal, of a greater ultimate end? Uh, mm -hmm. Or is giving to others an end in itself? 
and, and let me just ask you, you know, look at the whole New Testament, look at all of scripture, is giving to other people in need an end in itself? Or is it meant to do something else? And I would argue it's very clear throughout all of scripture, the purpose of giving to other people, the reason that we're commanded to do so, the reason it's good is because it's supposed to paint a picture of God. It's supposed to be a picture of God being full of abundance. And, and now, if you think of it that way, then this, this passage is actually very pro uh, sort of rational self-interest and even pro-capitalism, pro what you might call supply-side economics. Paul saying, stop being a parasite. Stop being uh, destruction-oriented where you're taking value from the world and from other people and just merely consuming it. Start producing value. Start being positively value oriented. And then you'll overflow with abundance like God does because God's positively value oriented. You'll be like God in that you'll overflow with abundance and you'll benefit other people at the same time. And we have to take, whenever we look at something like this from Ephesians, just take into account some other things that Paul has said, and that will help you understand the interpretation he would continue to take. So, uh, an instance, you know, Paul has also said, if Christ is not raised, your faith is in vain. Uh, he's, he's talking ultimately about going to heaven. He's talking ultimately about being in Jesus, having that relationship as the highest value. And we'll, we will get to more of those pro-egoism passages. Uh, but just cru- finishing up our, our sort of a tour of the New Testament from Philippians 2. We kind of, we read this a little bit, but just to, to mention it, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than themselves. Something to point out about, not everybody can simultaneously be better than everybody else. So it's a matter of putting them in your own mind, in your own attitude as if they were, uh, giving them the benefit of the doubt because you don't always know people's motivations and treating them as if they're more important than you. Uh, similar to love your neighbor as yourself, it's, uh, it, it's, it's not a command to self-sacrifice really. It's about assuming the best of other people, especially in that context, I think, assuming the best of your brothers in Christ, your brothers and sisters in Christ. It's about having a benevolent spirit that apart from evidence to the contrary, you assume the best of people. And, 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 and that's a, that's a healthy, um, benevolent way to go about living life. And, and it also pictures, uh, uh, the way that God treats us. Jacob, your motto is rational self-interest for those who love their life. That's, that's one of the things that you've said at your website before. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I want to ask you a question about that. Go ahead. Do you think you should love your life? Yes. Okay, and, so, the, and so, so I'm going to try to trick you. I'm going to try to trick you here. <laughs> Second Timothy 3, but understand this. In the last days, there will come times of difficulty for people will be lovers of self. Lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to the parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power, avoid such people. For among them are those who creep into households and capture weak women, burdened with sins and led astray by various passions, always learning and never able to arrive at a knowledge of the truth. Just as John Ace and John Brace opposed Moses, so also these men oppose the truth. Men corrupted in mind and disqualified regarding the faith. But they will not get very far, for their folly will be plain to all, as was that of those two men. I think so that me, the last little part of that passage helps interpret the whole thing. Yeah, let, let me ask you, is Paul describing somebody who is living fully and rationally? Is Paul describing somebody who loves life? Who, like actual objective life, rational life that loves this world and the God of this world and, and loves living in the light of the truth of the God of this world? Is, is that what Paul's describing there? Or is Paul describing somebody who is self-destructive and it, who is uh, slowly killing themselves and torturing themselves uh, and who will ultimately uh, be destroyed because of their short-sightedness and their folly and their irrationality? That's where he goes, and the fact that that's where he goes, but they will not get very far, tells you what his standard is operating. Mm-hmm. His, his standard is long-term, ultimate, rational self-interest, which is what the standard is all throughout Scripture. And I think what's really important is that, unfortunately, too many Christians, when they come to this issue of morality, they don't 
treat it the same way that they treat other theological issues. Um, you, you, can, you can look at all of these little verses that talk about sacrifice or talk about self-denial or talk about, um, you know, uh, thinking of others higher than yourselves, etc. You can look at all of those individually and, and isolated and you can use them to sort of proof text and justify this idea of altruism, uh, of self-sacrifice as an end in itself. But if you come at this systematically, if you come at this in a way that tries to integrate all of the information that scripture gives us on this topic in a system, then you can't do that. I, I mean, the, the way that most people treat this issue of morality is the way that most people who teach uh, works righteousness uh, treat verses on, on, on works and righteousness in scripture, right? You, 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 can, you can totally make really great arguments for works righteousness uh, contrary to uh, salvation by grace alone through faith alone, right? You, you can make lots of arguments for that by choosing lots of individual discrete scriptures and taking them out of context and sort of proof texting because there's a lot of very emphatic verses all throughout scripture, both Old and New Testament, especially New Testament, that link the importance of good works to salvation, to genuine salvation. So if you don't come at it systematically, you're going to run into error. And, and just like we insist on thinking systematically and putting everything in context on the issue of salvation by grace through faith alone, apart from works of the law, even though works are an important manifestation of that, just like we think about that issue systematically, we need to think about this issue of morality systematically. We need to treat this issue of morality the way that we treat every other theological issue, by taking all of the information and integrating it together into a system, into a whole, rather than just looking at proof texts. Jacob, do you have any idea why that has not been done so far in the academic world? I, I mean, there's probably a lot of reasons for it, but I think the number one reason is uh, that I think too many people take this morality of altruism, this morality of self-sacrifice as in itself for granted. I, I don't think that they're actually getting it from scripture. I think uh, we already believe it. We, we absorb it from the culture or absorb it from academia and, and from, you know, Kant, and it sort of filters on down through academia. Um, so it, it's sort of already assumed and that makes it really easy to sort of just uh, proof text and buttress that assumption with scripture rather than actually challenging uh, that assumption and, and seeing what does scripture actually teach if we, if we look at this systematically. Um, and part of it is, I think, um, a, a tendency to think of morality as, um, as not something that you can study. It's not something that you can uh, look at objectively and, and come to uh, strong conclusions the way that you can other areas of theology. Um, I, I think there's sort of a, a latent assumption, no one would say it, uh, but there's a latent assumption that morality is sort of subjective and that you really just kind of go with the flow. And as long as you're nice, and, and, and you know, niceness is sort of the implicit standard, as long as you're nice and as long as it doesn't rock the boat too much, uh, then uh, you're, you're doing okay. I agree with all of that. And it also relates to the is ought dichotomy from David Hume, where people think that, uh, th that normative concepts and standards are not scientifically demonstrable, that they're a whole different category from descriptive statements. Yeah, that you have to sort of just intuit uh, normative categories, moral categories, you have to just kind of assume it. Uh, and, and when you do that, the, the assumption is, whatever is dominant in the culture, which happens to be the morality of altruism in our day and age. Ruben posted something and I wanted to read it. He said, I think John Piper said something helpful here with regard to how we should love others as ourselves. The Christian hedonist is the one who takes his greatest pleasure in the enjoyment of God. Therefore, to love self best is to love all that is God. And to love others in the same way is to desire the same expression to be fulfilled in them. So uh, here, I know we're going to get to the point where other people get to jump in, but I wanted to just just briefly show that there is not this some supposed healthy tension between Jesus and Paul, because we presented Jesus's words as basically teaching seeking rewards, and then we showed a lot of potential objections that you might find in Paul. Well, Paul is a very didactic uh, writer. The the epistles are 
epistles. He's teaching. They're not narratives. <coughs> so it, it's possible that you could look at what we've read so far and come to the conclusion that Paul is pushing back against uh, this idea of egoism. But let's see whether Paul has anything else to say on the issue. So we'll start in Romans 4. Um, so this is Paul describing Abraham, the founder of our faith. This is something that a friend of ours, Shireen Joanna, she pointed out. And once I heard it, I thought, oh gosh, wow. Okay, so what is this telling us about the essence of faith? Romans 4.20, he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully persuaded that what he had promised he was able to perform and therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. This idea of trusting God to give us the blessings that he has promised to us that is faith. So if you're concerned with like with being a Christian and being a, somebody who places your faith in Jesus, then you're somebody who trusts God's promises. And so this is how central this idea of seeking God's rewards and his promises is to the concern of any Christian. Yeah, and, you, can't, and you can't get away from it. It's faith. By the way, that, that, that's tied to the faith chapter in Hebrews 11. Where, where Paul says, if, uh, if we're going to come to him, we must come to him believing that he is and that he is the rewarder of those who seek him. You, you, you have to come to God for reward in order to come to him in faith. And, and, and what that means is reward for yourself. You're, you're trusting in his promises to you. It's, it's personal. It, it's not that you're trusting in his promises to Joe down the street. You're, you're trusting in his promise to you as an individual, as a person, as an image of God. Uh, and, and, and you can't do that and, 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 and really hope in that promise if you think that it's immoral to hope for what's good for you, if it's immoral to seek after that which is ultimately good for you. So Romans eight seventeen, we suffer with him that we may be also glorified together. Speak from Paul. And he reckons these sufferings at the present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. And of course, Romans 8, 28, we know that all things work together for the good of those that love God to them that are called according to his purpose. Yeah. Do, do, you, do you look forward to being glorified? Do you look forward to the glory of God being revealed in you to all of creation? Or do you feel ashamed at that thought? Because I, I look forward to it. That, that, that's the Christian hope. That's the joy set before us that Christ purchased for us on the cross. That, that's what we were meant to be. Do you feel free in looking forward to that? Because you ought to. And, and I, I despise this morality, this masochistic morality that says that we ought not look forward to that, that we ought to shy away from that, that we ought to... Uh, uh, diminish that in, in false humility and say, no, no, woe is me, you know, focus that spotlight on somebody else. Um, the, the spotlight's on Christ. You don't have to worry about stealing his spotlight, but he, he's going to integrate us into that glory. And we should be excited about that rather than thinking that that's somehow immoral. Is the capitalist ethos compatible with Christianity? If everything that we've just said is true, then absolutely. I, I think I think far from what too many people, too many even defenders of capitalism, uh, talk about uh, heaven as if it's going to be a socialist paradise. That they, they they talk about the reason that we need capitalism today is because everybody's sinful, and and so we don't want the government to have too much power, and and so the reason that we need freedom from government power today is because of sin. Implication being, well, if there wasn't any sin, then it would be perfectly reasonable for uh, people to rule our lives and make economic decisions for us, et cetera, et cetera. I, I think that's completely false. I think that heaven's going to be a capitalist paradise where we have an ultimate value orientation, meaning a profit-seeking orientation of producing, of producing physical wealth. Uh, we're, we're going to work in heaven. We're going to be physical beings on a physical world dealing with physical reality and, and producing things that are of value and glorifying God through it. And I, I think it's gonna be amazing. And, and we ought to try to start that as much as possible this side of eternity. I think 
Paul agrees with you. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 8, he that plants and he that waters are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. And then verse 14, if any man's work abide, which he has built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. And then in chapter 9, verse 7, who goes to war at any time at his own charges, who plants a vineyard and eats not of the fruit thereof, who feeds a flock and eats not of the milk of the flock? Say I these things as a man, or, or say not the law the same also. And he talks about the law of Moses and caring for oxen. Um, and we're going to head to 1 Corinthians 15. I think we're still in 1 Corinthians. Um, for if the dead rise not, then it is, yeah, I already got that one. Skip to Ephesians 5, uh, you know, the passage about husbands. Love your wives as Christ loves the church and gave himself for it. And he says in 28, so ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. It takes it for granted that, that no one ever hated their own flesh. Ephesians 6, he reiterates the promise from the Ten Commandments that if children will honor their father and mother, that it may be well with thee, that you may live long on the earth. And in that same chapter, verse 8, knowing that whatever good thing that any man does, that same he shall receive of the Lord, whether he, is, uh, whether he be bond or free. Uh, moving to Philippians 3, but what things were gained to me, those I counted as loss for Christ. Ye doubtless, and I count all things but loss for, for the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ, and be found in him. I love it when Paul uses the connecting word that, so that. In Colossians, whatever you do, do it heartily to the Lord. This is in chapter 3. He says, knowing that of the Lord you shall receive the reward. In 1 Timothy 4, bodily exercise profits little, but godliness is profitable unto all things. Having promise of the life that is now and of that which is to come. This is a faithful saying worthy of all acceptance. For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially of those who believe. And in verse 16, take heed to yourself and to your doctrine, continue in them. For in doing this, you shall both save yourself and those that hear you. So save yourself is not an unchristian message. Peter said it. Paul said it. Second Timothy chapter 2. Therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that, that goes to war and tangles himself in the affairs of life that he may please him um, that has chosen him to be a soldier. And he, he says, strive. He says, consider what I'm saying and God will give you understanding into these things. It, it sounds to me like Paul anticipated that Timothy would have some of the concerns that we see in the church today. And Paul is telling him, husband man who labors is going to take part in the fruits don't let your eyes get away from the goal he says endure all things for the elect's sake they may obtain the salvation which is in jesus christ with eternal glory it is a faithful saying for if we be dead with him we shall also live with him that's the goal all right so now we've gone through our overview of scripture i know we, we've taken quite a quite a deep, deep dive into it this is now the time where I want to open up the floor and ask a couple of people to share with us. And we'll start with Colin. Share with us about what was your experience like as this question was going through your mind originally? Was it difficult to, um, to shift your paradigm? Uh, <clears throat> not really at all. Once I first read Atlas Shrugged about four years ago, and uh, that kind of got me on the Ayn Rand kick there. And I read a fair amount of her work after that. And it really appealed to me. And as I read through the Bible, reading that, her, her work kind of opened my eyes to this right here, that there is an ultimate goal in everything that you do. And, and it's not just for you to be completely destroyed, that you live, you live your life with a sense of integrity and accomplishing goals. And that is actually truly living versus somebody who's just existing in the world. And one last thing, I've been in uh, youth ministry and pastoral ministry for the past 10 years, and um, people wash out of the ministry when they lose sight of their motivations. You know, they, they forget why they're doing it. And um, 
this attitude right here, knowing that Jesus put up with hardship, knowing that there was a bigger goal in mind, knowing that he was actually working towards something, and uh, reading Rand and seeing how that fit in with, with uh, what we've been talking about here today, that's really helped me settle on my motivation to keep me motivated because ministry can be tough. Dealing with people can be tough and uh, just any, any job's tough, but just dealing with church people can be tough. A lot of them are good, but a lot of them are tough. And um, if, as long as you don't find your motivation in trying to please other people, and I've noticed that as long as I can look Jesus Christ in the eye and say, I did the right thing and I did the job, and I can look myself in the eye and say, I did the right thing and I did the good job, then I'm square. Because, and, and it was reading Rand and this notion of rational self-interest that really helped me understand that. And therefore, it keeps me motivated to keep, you know, endure the shame, endure the hardship, because you know you've got this big goal at the end that you're working toward. I love that, Colin. Thank you for sharing about that. Let's go over to Walter next. Hey, guys. Um, so my experience is very similar to Colin's in that, you know, I've been I've identified as Christian for uh, my entire life. I was actually converted in young adulthood. Uh, and I've been a, I've identified as a conservative, a political conservative for as long as I've been aware of what that term meant. However, early on, there was a, a sense of incompleteness is the word I'll choose um, and uncertainty and a, a sort of apprehension that I, I've now perceived to be widely held throughout both Christianity and conservatism. It always seems as though conservatives and Christians are to one degree or another apologizing for their own worldview um, and conceding points that are uh, actually antithetical to their espoused worldview in order to try to, to go with the flow and fit in with the culture. And, you know, I always perceived that, but I never quite understood why it was. And I had uh, the, the similar dual revelation that Colin describes of, on the one hand, first encountering the work of Ayn Rand, and being exposed to the idea of rational self-interest and having that really appeal and exploring it and testing it and finding it to be true. And then in turn, going back and reading the Bible and realizing, wow, this, is, this concept of rational self-interest is entirely intertwined. And like once you realize that it's there, it's everywhere. Everywhere you look throughout scripture, God is talking about his own glory, his own good, his own name. I did this for me. I did this for my sake. I did this for my name's sake. It's from front to back through every book. It's throughout it. And tied in with that is every exhortation to the believer to follow God, follow Christ, be in the word, uh, act right, so to speak. It's all within the context of that ultimate goal, that ultimate reason, which is being part of the glorification of Christ, being glorified along with Christ for his name and finding satisfaction in his name. And this is, this is a concept that when we talk, when the church talks about joy, which it's, it seems as though this is something we have, we, we have kind of a schizophrenic, the, the kind of universal global church has this sort of schizophrenic view of joy, where on the one hand, we sing songs about it, and we preach about it, but we don't really have it. We don't really express it a whole lot. And I think the reason why is because the most churchgoers are dealing with this, this kind of schizophrenic, um, contrary push and pull in their lives, where on the one hand, they, they know they're supposed to take joy in their faith, but on the other hand, they're told and they believe to one extent or another that they're supposed to be self-sacrificial, that they're supposed to be self-denying, and they're supposed to be giving, giving their own joy up and what have you. And when you realize the truth, the biblical truth uh, of the role that rational self-interest plays in God's plan and in the, the role of the believer, then it really frees you up and gives you that, that sort of on-fire conviction to be an evangelist because you want to share with other people. You want other people to experience what you're experiencing, which is the capacity to live a joyful life, a truly guilt-free, joyful, overflowing with abundance and joy, like the scripture talks about, 
life that that is rooted in the ultimate goal and the the assurance that we are going to be glorified in Christ. I mean, it's a, there there is there is no tension, as has been previously stated, no tension between Christ and Paul, no tension between joy and service. You know, and, and you know, just one analogy I'll throw out, and then I'll I'll pass the the buck, as it were. When we think about our own personal lives, we think about our relationships with our family, our kids, our wives, our spouses. We serve them, but we don't do it in a self-sacrificial way. The reason why I'm interested in making my wife happy is not in spite of myself. It's because of myself. I want to be the source of her happiness I want her to find fulfillment in me just as I find fulfillment in her. And so when we, when we think about this concept of, of loving others as yourself, loving your wife as you love your own body, that's the, the synergy that's really being pointed to there is that it's not service. And, and you spoke earlier of um, if you do all these things that are considered to be loving deeds, but you don't do it with love, then you haven't really done it. Well, how can you, how can you do loving deeds and do them without love? Well, that's how. If, you, if you're not doing it because you actually care about the other person's happiness and find your own fulfillment in their happiness, then there is no love. So self-interest is, is not just a corollary. It's a prerequisite. You have to be self-interested in order to be capable of love in the first place, and that's what gives love value. Thank you, Walter. Jacob, did you want to add anything? And then after that, we'll go to CJ. Oh, man. Uh, I'll, I'll wait till the end of all this because I, I, I'm, I'm resonating so well and, and loving everything that everybody's saying. So I, I'll, I'll just hold it all in until the end. <laughs> cool. Let me unmute you, CJ. There you go. Okay. Uh, my thoughts really was, um, I guess, just going back to the definition of altruism. Um, and I feel um, a precising definition as opposed to a lexical definition is very helpful. The reason why is because a lot of the confusion around altruism is because um, a lot of people automatically think the opposite of altruism is selfishness. So if you're not an altruist, you're selfish. And there's also some misconceptions about the difference between selfishness and rational self-interest in my mind. Now I know that, and I may be wrong here, but the classical objectivist may conflate the two that selfishness is actually rational self-interest. I don't agree with that. I think they're fundamentally different, but that's, you know, that's a discussion for a different day. The other thing is also, as you talk about altruism, we have to distinguish between the hard form of altruism, which you know, is referred to as pure altruism, um, as in that, for example, um, all your motives are other regarding, and there's nothing in it, so there's no mixed motives whatsoever. There's also the distinction between other regarding motives and self-regarding motives the distinction between extrinsic and, extre and intrinsic desires, and the distinction between long-term self-interest and short-term self-interest. So I might, I might appear to be acting altruistically in the short term, but in the long term, if it's going to benefit me ultimately, I'm actually acting in my rational self-interest. But that could be confused as altruism because of the short-term pain or sacrifice I'm prepared to go through. And there's also the definition of sacrifice, where there's different definitions. I think that Anne Rand's lexicon implies that sacrifice means sacrificing a greater good for a lesser good, whilst the lexical definition implies the opposite. Sacrifice implies sacrificing a lesser good for a greater good. You see what I mean? So all those terms, one at a time, what you know, individually, are responsible for a lot of confusion about what altruism is you know, out there. Um, and I think it's important to clarify that. Lastly, one experience I had as a young Christian, um, I was so much, I guess, in the camp of uh, um, asceticism, if you like, that even playing the piano or listening to music that I enjoyed, I felt guilt from simply because I was enjoying myself. And when I came across the virtue of selfishness, that literally set me free because I realized actually you could, it is in your own interest to enjoy yourself, to embrace your values. And of course, in embracing that with, with, with your Christian values, you know, um, this is why I can confidently say Jesus was not an altruist, you know, for the joy, Jesus for the joy that was set before him for the joy that was set before him. <laughs> you know what I mean? He was clearly acting in his long-term self-interest, even though he was also other regarding in sacrificing himself for the love of, 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 you know, of, of, of his children. So, you know, that's it. Wow. Thank you. That was awesome. 
<coughs> cool. Uh, look, Adam, you want to share next? <clears throat> yeah, can you hear me? <clears throat> yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Yeah, that what CJ said about embrace your values is so, so powerful. And it's so Christ-like when we look at, you know, Christ setting his face towards, like Flint, towards Jerusalem and just being single-minded about his mission on earth and what he's going to do, what he came for. He's going, he's doing this and he's going back to the father and he's purchasing something for himself. It's just so good to frame everything in terms of values and people. And that's the hidden entrance point where the left likes to attack us is on the level of values, you know, and if they can get us to compromise our values and outsource our values to something that we don't value and sacrifice a, a greater value for a lesser, like th they can, they can make emotional appeals and make you feel good and make you feel like you're doing something great, you know, <laughs> and it just miscarries. It's a contradiction and it never, never pays off. Um, and just the idea of, holding to a value and serving that value, embracing your values, like CJ said, um, just has a Christ-like quality to it. And it, and I, I, I don't know that I would have seen that without my exposure to Ayn Rand and Jacob <laughs> and really forcing a lot of these things into my consideration. You know, I had the desiring God, John Piper, Christ values what he values, but bringing that down to me valuing what I value and conforming those values to what Christ values, you know, and so that when we're caring for others, um, it's not just a not caring for myself. That's the point. It's caring for others that might be the body, you know, and that either are the body or that God might call them to be his body, you know? And so we can do all the things that an altruist would do um, if, if that's lining up with our values, if that's lining up with how we're valuing Christ and seeing him and caring for his body and all that stuff without sacrificing what we do value. The term value orientation is, has been so helpful for me. All right, let's yeah. go over. Colin, you wanted to add something there? Yeah, just real quick. One other thing that Rand wrote about that, I mean, has it, it got stuck in my brain and it, it never found its way out. I don't think it ever should. It's our idea of uh, secondhanders, uh, you know, seeking, you know, your self-esteem through others. That completely changed my life. That That might be might be one of the main things that, that I've, I mean, it just reoriented my whole way of seeing the world. I would, I would love to discuss that concept in detail one day real soon. Yeah. And just real quick that the biblical corollary to that concept, I think is uh, being a man pleaser or, or a man fearer uh, of fearing man rather than God of, of getting your, your standards and your value and, and your ideas through other men rather than directly between you and God. Also, that they have created cisterns that don't hold water. Though, I mean, all the, all the prophets condemn the people for seeking these values that are just useless. And it's because they inherited them from the idol-worshiping nations around them. All right, uh, so let's go to Ruben next. You would raise your hand. Oh, we can't hear you, Ruben. Here, I'll press the unmute button. There you go. Uh, still not working. I don't know why. You try it. There you go. Okay, good. Oh, now we can hear you. All right, great. Um, all right, so I just wanted to talk about something, and I don't know if maybe I'm confusing the uh, issues here, but when I think of altruism versus rational self-interest or egoism, as you guys have, have called it, um, but I keep thinking about morality and where that comes from, right? So, and the reason I think about this is the moral atheist. Right. We have these people who do not believe in God, and yet they do things that are morally correct. But in a sense of what is truly moral, I think this is the moral argument on who actually owns morality. 
So the definition of love, the definition of what is good and worthy of praise, all of that comes from and is defined by God. And in Hebrews 11, 6, you guys already mentioned it, without faith, it is impossible to please him. So in reality, when we look at altruism versus egoists, atheists have to be altruists. They have to be, because it's impossible for them to be uh, a person who ascribes to rational self-interest. Because if they did, as we described before, those that truly love, those that are truly morally good are those that seek the self-interest uh, or um, the best for others. And that would be to have a knowledge and understanding of Christ and who he is and to enjoy in him and in that. And yeah, so, not do that. yeah, so it's possible for an atheist to, uh, to have the goal of rational self-interest, um, right. but it, it's not possible for them to actually live fully rationally self-interested because they don't have a rational worldview. They're, they're missing right. a big piece right. of it. So it, it, it will look... Uh, like rational self-interest from the outside, but uh, in, in final analysis, it will be irrational. Right. right. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, CJ, you're next. <clears throat> I think I already spoke. Okay. I uh, got it. Okay. I thought you'd raise your hand a second time. <laughs> All right. Anybody else? And and then I'm trying to get one other person to, to jump in real quick. Uh, there's, there's, there's a guest that may have time to jump in in just a minute. Yeah, Matt, you haven't added anything. Do, do you want to say? Yeah, I mean, I don't know if I have anything extra to add, but, um, but essentially for me, it was kind of self-evident that, that um, we were called to act in our own self-interest. I think I even questioned you one time about where the threat to this philosophy was. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm not feeling well today, so might be uh, cough a little bit. But um, but yeah, um, so it's always been kind of self-evident to me. But I guess I didn't realize how much the scriptures shouted it. To use a, I don't know. I guess that's that's really the only thing that kind of surprised me, is I never noticed where it all was until y'all started talking about it. Excellent. So now we've made, we've laid down somewhat of a case, but I want to just make that case even a little bit stronger. We didn't go here yet, but Jacob, check this out. I want to ask you, can you defend this? Do you think this is defensible? So our thesis could be that this idea that Jesus is an altruist is one of the most effeminizing, insidious, and blasphemous contemporary heresies. And the preachers who say that Jesus is an altruist and that his love goes beyond reason, crazy love, uh, irrational love. The preachers that say that his actions are not fundamentally reasonable and for his own sake are being unfaithful to scripture. Yeah, I, hopefully I can defend it because I, I wrote the first part and I, I'm pretty sure you wrote the second part. <laughs> so, uh, uh, absolutely. So I, you know, I, I said the part about uh, the morality of altruism being effeminizing and heretical and blasphemous. And, and I think that's absolutely accurate. So the, the effeminizing uh, speaks to what both Colin and Walter talked about and, and Adam too a little bit in terms of <clears throat> uh, the freedom to live your life, the freedom to embrace your values, as CJ said, I think, the, the freedom to, to be on mission, to do according to your convictions to live as God has called you to live. Um, that, that, that is something that especially men are supposed to be about. It's, it's not that women aren't supposed to be about that, but that's particularly characteristic of a masculine attitude. And uh, the, the idea that we shouldn't um, be on mission, the idea that we should uh, shy away from expanding our own, uh, the influence of our own lives and of our mission and of our values and of our, um, our passion, it is is effeminizing. It it, it it truncates our abilities. It, it makes us unsure and and shamed and and ridden with guilt as we attempt to accomplish things for Christ in the world. And so that's why I say it's effeminizing. It's also blasphemous, and this is the most important thing to me, anyways. And, and that is because it 
it completely robs Jesus of his joy, of his passion, like I said it before. It, it's atheistic. It, it has this idea of the cross where Jesus died for the sake of dying. He suffered for the sake of suffering, and he wasn't doing it for the sake of the joy set before him. He wasn't doing it uh, in order to uh, be exalted and in order to have the joy of redeeming a people. He wasn't doing it with eternal glory in mind. And, and that's just a blasphemous, disgusting view of God. Um, God is the ultimate egoist. And, and as, uh, I forget who said it, maybe a couple of people said it, that's over and over and over again, all throughout scripture. I think it was Walter. Uh, you, you can't get around God talking about his glory and, and that he does everything for his glory. So this morality of altruism that says that it's immoral to be self-interested is completely antithetical to the biblical God. Uh, so th th that's my defense of those things. But let me just throw in uh, my, my own sort of testimony about this uh, and my comments on what everybody else said. Um, and and I, I'm really thankful that we were all able to kind of to talk about this and, and how this ideology has shaped our lives. I, I, I kind of saw it as self-evident, uh, similar to Matt, uh, when I first became a Christian as well. Um, even before ex experiencing, uh, you know, Piper's books, um, it, it was something that I was, I was always kind of trying to figure out why, why was everybody so um, self-effacing and, and obsessed with what seemed like false humility. Um, but it was something I really struggled with uh, because, you know, I, I found myself praying that, you know, I, I, I had this idea that I got from the church that, um, that, you know, John Baptist says, I must decrease and he must increase. And I had been taught through a couple of different churches that that was like a, a rule of the universe, so that the extent to which I decrease is the extent to which he increases. And I found myself praying one day, God, decrease me as much as possible in order to increase yourself. In, in fact, send me to hell if that's what it would take for you to be glorified in my life. And then I realized, wait a second, that doesn't make any sense. The, the whole reason, the whole motivation for me praying this way was so that God would be glorified in me and so that I could, I could enjoy him being glorified in, in me. And I can't do that from hell. And, and, and that's when I started realized there's a contradiction here that there's something really wrong here. And, and as I read Piper uh, and his Christian hedonism, that started to help, but it, it still, it still never clicked because it, there, there was still a conflict. I, I wanted to glorify God to the max but when I did, when I, when I tried to exert energy of my mind or my values or my life, my actions, when I tried to expand my values, my mind, my life, that there was this sense of shame, like you're being selfish, you, you, you. Uh, and, and it wasn't until I, I really challenged that through reading stuff from Ayn Rand that I realized, wait a second, that there's no reason to be ashamed of expanding your life, of expanding the work of your mind, of expanding your values, of living your life to the max for the glory of God. That there really is no problem with that. And 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 like so many of you guys said, it is so freeing. It, it's it's such a a marvelous and wonderful thing to know that I can live as God created me to live and and expand my life to the max. And and, and the way I think about it is I I want to lay down the most glorious crown at Jesus's feet when I get to heaven. And, and, and by that crown, I mean my life. I want my life to be as big, as glorious, as maximally impacting as possible in order to lay that down at his feet to his glory, because he's that, that worthy. And, and this morality of altruism would keep me from doing that. It would chain me in order to keep me from glorifying him to the max in my life because that's the only way I can do it is through my life. And I have to be able to value my life and myself in order to do that. For many people, all the things that we're saying are just common sense. This is the way people live if they just use their eyes. But for the more intellectual types, for the people that have read a lot of the important Christian thinkers or for people that have gone into ministry, this is such a challenge. And I think it especially affects people that want to go into ministry because they think, but am I just exalting myself? Am I putting myself on a pedestal? And that holds people back from confidently becoming a man 
And I, I think that's, that's insidious. So that's one of the reasons why I think that there's so much at stake. All right, let's go over to Walter. All right, guys, uh, I had mentioned earlier on um, talking about how once you grasp the concept of rational self-interest and you go back and start reading the Bible that you can see it everywhere. And I wanted to just provide you guys with a, a quick passage that I think exemplifies this. And I'm going to risk being a little bit sacrilegious um, by describing it as the original gangster rap, because I really do, I really do feel as though God in, in a very particular way was kind of the original <laughs> gangster rapper. This is what he had to say in Isaiah chapter 44, um, verses six through eight. He says, thus says the Lord, the King of Israel and his redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God who is like me. Let him proclaim it. Let him declare and set it before me. Since I appointed an ancient people, let them declare what is to come and what will happen. Fear not, nor be afraid. I have told you from the uh, old and declared it. You are my witnesses. Is there a God beside me? There is no rock. I know not any. So, you know, God is not shy about declaring his own majesty. And that's really what the entire word is about. That's really what the entire Bible is about, is him declaring his own word. That's what history is about. That's what we are about. That's what creation is about. And we should take joy in that. I just wanted to share that with you guys. Thank you. That's awesome. And then Ruben, your hand is also, or it was raised. You're good? Okay. Let me know. Yes. Can you hear me? Go ahead. Okay. Um, I wanted to ask a question. How does this... Um, Rational self-interest. So there's, uh, I believe I saw something recently about it becoming legal for doctors to help in uh, self-assisted suicide. Um, what do you say to those who are saying that that's in their best interest, right? Because I think this also affects our view of suffering and the view of suffering in general, right? Because when we devalue suffering, it, it makes sense that there is a rational self-interest for someone to not have to suffer no so so what, what we're saying is there's no value in suffering as such um <clears throat> but that that so uh in other words it, it wouldn't be rational to uh say um don't give me any pain relieving drugs in my suffering uh i just want to suffer for the sake of suffering but that's not the same thing as suicide uh, suicide is irrational because you don't own your life. God owns your life and you have no right to take it. Uh, and, and, a, and, a, and a physician has no right to do you harm, even though you ask him to do you harm any more than he would have a right to, uh, to kill you uh, or, or to cut off your leg if you were in perfectly good health um, just because you asked him to. So it, it's not rational self-interest to uh, partake in any form of suicide, whether it's physician assisted or not. Um, but it is rational to avoid suffering without killing yourself if you can, if, if it's not, if it doesn't have any long-term consequences. Uh, now, if, if the medicine that you take to avoid, alleviate the pain is going to be addictive, then it, it probably is irrational to, to avoid the pain in that case. So it, it depends on what the, the fuller context and the long-term consequences are. Back to Walter. Walter, your hand's up, but I don't know if you're here. There you are. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know why it's up. Was that oh. me? <laughs> All right. Something uh, I, I wanted to mention at this point in the discussion is that there is a history of how people have in, inter, intergate, trying to say two different words at the same time, interfaced and engaged with this idea. And so one of the things that we find in the work of Ayn Rand, who has said helpful things about egoism, is that she also said some unhelpful things about Christianity. And she is under the impression that the, uh, the altruist reading of scripture is the orthodox reading of scripture. But uh, we've had some success talking to people that are from the objectivist train of thought or that are familiar with it, that are willing to reconsider. And I point this out because the, the fact is, I have a dog in this fight, but an objectivist doesn't because from their point of view, they're just looking at it and they're saying, well, it doesn't matter what Christ taught because I'm not following Christ. Now, a non-Christian's interpretation of scripture is not nearly as valuable as the interpretation of somebody who loves scripture. But in the case, of, in, in, the, um, in, in the words of 
two or three witnesses, let all matters be established. Let me share with you an email I got from somebody. Uh, they said, he says, I'm not a Christian, but I have a strong interest in understanding Christianity. From what I've studied and understood, I'm glad to conclude that Christianity contains no altruism. I would argue that altruism is a post-Christian and anti-Christian concept. And he talks about Compt and uh, he thought that Christianity was too selfish and too egotistical. And he thought these were bad qualities. And so he tried to change Christianity. So, and that's, there are many people that are willing to see this. On the other hand, there are many Christians and especially pastors who are not at all open to reconsidering this. When I hear, uh, when I see on Facebook, there will be people that say something very, very self-effacing and very much like he must increase and I must decrease type of a thing. Sometimes I will send them a link to that Christian intellectual dot com slash egoism. And I will ask them, could you just read through this and consider whether or not some of these verses may be saying the opposite of what you think? And I've had very little success with pastors. I think partly it's, uh, it's a, it's a matter of they, they feel that the time of their reconsidering these things is behind them. So strategically the, the way for us to have an impact on bringing this truth to the world is to find new Christian intellectuals. It's to find people that are young or it's to, to find people that have not yet engaged the issue. It's, it's been a frustrating experience for me, at least, generally speaking, talking to people that are already somewhat intellectually developed because there's just a lot, there's a whole structure, a whole house of cards that they're going to have to knock down in order for them to see the truth of this issue. That said, there have been a few people that have said, you know what, you really changed my mind on this, even Christians. So that's, a, that's my personal experience. I would also report my experience as a you know, 20 year old and in trying to reinterpret scripture, the, one of the hardest ones for me was when in Acts, Paul says that Jesus said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And, but I always heard it quoted as, it's better to give than to receive. And once I realized it was more blessed, that solved the problem. Mm-hmm. And so th- that's a, a little bit of a summary of of my experience with it. I had to, for a significant period of months, I had to really look into it before I was willing to change my mind because everybody in my life believed the uh, the other way. So uh, Jacob, I'm going to give us a couple of resources and then ask you if you have some closing thoughts. So one resource from an author that um, is a staff, former staff member at Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, Dr. Chad Brand, wrote a book specifically asking the question, is Jesus an altruist? It's called Clash of Titans, Atlas Shrugged, John Galt, and Jesus Christ. You can find it on Amazon, and it's, it's cool. It, it shows uh, why John Galt in Atlas Shrugged is a hero, and it shows why Jesus is very much like John Galt in his attitude toward the world. So there's that. And then if you would like to hear more about what Jacob and I have already done on this topic, I would recommend our podcast number four, five, and six. So just go to christianintellectual.com slash podcast zero zero four and five and six. And if you would like to become a patron, find us at christianintellectual.com slash Patreon. You can join in these monthly discussions. So Jacob, closing thoughts, and we'll, we'll wrap up for this week. I think the best closing thought is just don't be ashamed to live your life and to have a positive value orientation namely the the orientation toward glorifying god to the max in every part of your life here and now and then looking forward to the kingdom to come uh, and 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 work to spread that that passion and that freedom to others because that's how god is genuinely and maximally going to be glorified in the lives of other people that we're ministering to. Excellent. All right. You guys have a great week. See you guys. Thanks.